adoption is fairly brief because I think the robust conversation that's going to take place between representatives of business and industry, higher education, and K-12 educators here, along with dialogue from all of you as community members, is an exciting opportunity for us to define what 21st century learning means in the K-12 system here, knowing full well that that has impact on having our students' career and college ready. And you will probably hear a duplication of some terms like career and college ready throughout this evening. And that, we hope, will be one of your takeaways, because the skill set involved for both of those um, are much similar, much more similar than many people think they are. In part, we hope what our parents walk away with is an expanded understanding of what it means and what the implications are for our district to have your children career and college ready. During the course of the evening, we hope to identify with your help some of the things that our school district does very, very well. And it's our intent to continue those, and at the same time, stretch those of us that work in the system, as well as you as a community, to know what we might need to do differently to have students' career and college ready in the 21st century. We recognize that we're 12 years into that time period already, but we're going through a time period where there is tremendous change in public education in this country. And I'm not sure how many people really realize that on a national level right now, the two biggest influencers on national education policy are really business and foundations. And while some of us as edu educators may feel threatened by that, I don't think that we need to. Because preparing kids for the 21st century gives us an opportunity to partner with this country and move us positively forward in the right direction that will support a quality of life that we all want for the children we serve and the future generations of, of, of this country. If I could give you one visual in your mind that you take away tonight, it would be an umbrella, a simple umbrella. And if you think of that umbrella as 21st century learning and the skills associated with that, the different ribs of that umbrella are some of the things that we already do very well as a school system. We offer alternatives to kids in the area of the International Baccalaureate Program. We offer the more traditional path to college, which is the AP, the Advanced Placement Classes, um, and frankly, the rigor of our curriculum, even for students that don't take advantage of IB or AP. We have, I think, uh, career and technical education programming that we should be proud of as a community. We've worked very hard to deliver that curriculum and provide those opportunities for our students. And yet, in my mind, that's still not enough for what we need to offer our children so they're prepared for the future. And that affords us the opportunity, really, to take a look and for me to announce publicly for the first time this evening that Midland Public Schools is going to take some time during the course of the calendar year 2012 examining what a new tech program might look like in Midland Public Schools, perhaps as early as by the fall of 2013. If we do that, it does not mean that we don't value those programs that I previously mentioned. It means it's another alternative in which we can use to engage students in learning. And if you don't think that that needs to be a priority for us, I'd ask you to think about your own children, or perhaps your grandchildren, and watch them on a daily basis and see what engages them. And you're likely to see some of the components of what we think in our early research on defining 21st, 21st century learning is during this presentation and this panel discussion this evening. And I won't go into those at this point in time. I'd like to introduce our moderator uh, for this evening, and that is Kim Houston Philpott. She is the Global Community Relations Director and President of Dow Corning Foundation. Kim's got a long history in the community, and during that history, she has been very supportive of business education partnerships. This evening is an opportunity to dialogue with you, our community, to help us define what 21st century learning could and should look like for Midland Public Schools. I hope you enjoyed the evening. 
what oversight, my apologies. In order to uh, set the um, cue for this evening, we'd like to invite you to watch a 10 minute PowerPoint presentation that will give us all the context we're having our conversation tonight. My <laughs> Welcome to Defining 21st Century Learning at Midland Public Schools. We're very happy you can be joining us. Midland Public Schools has a vision statement that states, we will provide a dynamic world-class education that develops the unique talents of all our students in a safe, secure, and healthy environment. Our mission statement states that MPS, in partnership with our community, prepares students as knowledgeable, self-reliant, cooperative, and ethical learners who are contributing citizens. MPS is working on a framework to evaluate current practices, identify new instructional methods, and vet new educational models to better prepare students to be college and career ready. We have worked with our business community to identify strengths and areas of improvement in our program. The following presentation is a reflection of that dialogue. Our goal is to gather input, gain insights from our community, and confirm that we are on the right track. Midland Public Schools has a long established record for preparing students academically. This is still our highest priority. Of course, we do this by providing rigorous content and curriculum. This has resulted in some outstanding academic performance on behalf of our MPS graduates. For example, in the year 2008-2009, the latest available for this kind of data, 83.1% of our students enrolled in college after graduation compared to 71.4%, which is the state average. Out of the 83.1% that enrolled, 87.1% persisted to earn a year's worth of college credit compared to only 74.4% of the state average. Also for the same year, Colleges reported that the percent of our students that did not require remediation at the college level was 80.1% compared to the state average of 64.4%. In terms of ACT achievement, in 2011, the district's average ACT composite score was 23.4 compared to the state average of 20.0 and a national average of 21.1. It would be very difficult for MPS students to perform at this level if we didn't have a highly qualified and dedicated staff, K-12 in the entire system. Habits of Success As children grow, they develop habits that determine their success both in and outside of school. Learning behaviors are part of the elementary report cards and are stressed and modeled throughout their schooling. We heard clearly from our business community that this should continue to be an area of focus. As part of our process, we are revisiting these habits. Habits of success not only have an impact academically, but for student success in college and beyond. These habits, sometimes called essential skills, include attention to time, including attendance, punctuality, and time management, social competence, including attitude, social interactions, and other work-related behavior, work performance, including initiative, attention to task, work ethic, perseverance, or just plain grit, and quality of work, and personal presentation, word choices, appropriate clothing choices for the situation, etc. Engaging with relevance. It clearly is not enough to give students knowledge. They must engage with that knowledge to understand and apply it in relevant activities. Teaching and learning is no longer about the teacher giving a student information and the student repeating it back. Students need to develop skills that allow them to be engaged with their learning and apply that knowledge that they have gained to relevant situations. Technology integration. Technology continues to advance at a rapid pace. It has become an important tool within the school and the work worlds. 
For students, it is not about how to use the latest and greatest piece of hardware. It is about using the available technology to complete the task effectively and efficiently. It is also about developing skills that allow growth and flexibility as the technology changes. Another important point is the global connectedness inherent in technology. Social media has opened up instant communication globally. We recognize the impact as citizens of countries on the other side of the world have reached out to shape the world opinion on their issues. The business market literally and figuratively is virtually worldwide. Students simply must be prepared to operate in this market and maintain a positive virtual image that leads to success. These are the solid basis on which our educational programs are built. To prepare students for college and the career world which have changed significantly since the establishment of the traditional school structure, another focus has emerged. Those of you working outside the education system know, and those of us in the educational field have seen that there has been a change in the work culture. The career possibilities to which our, our current students have or will have access is significantly different. How do we prepare students for careers that don't even exist today? It is difficult to imagine the world our students who are just entering kindergarten will experience. We need to be flexible enough to shift where the change is, always looking to the next 10 to 15 years. It is no longer just gaining knowledge that is critical. To be future ready for college and career, students must engage in their learning differently in order to become equipped for the global economy. The term 21st century learning skills represents these crucial concepts. At Midland Public Schools, we create an environment for students to become more productive citizens when we, one, provide rigorous curriculum content, two, provide a learning environment in which students are engaged in relevant activities in which students collaborate to build on an understanding of the topic, communicate, think critically, and reflect on their learning, and produce creative solutions to demonstrate their knowledge. And three, when we create a culture that develops habits for success. Critical thinking is the ability to understand, analyze, synthesize, and apply knowledge to new situations. Most students can memorize information given to them and then give the information back on a test. Many of us were very good at this in our schooling. But oddly enough, once that test passed, much of that knowledge faded away. Now, with so much new information coming so quickly, it is impossible to memorize it all. Instead, students need to be able to understand and gather new information, analyze it, put it together with their prior knowledge, and use it to solve new problems in situations that arise. One measure of our success has always been our students' performance on state and national assessments like the Michigan Merit Exam and the ACT. The developers of these assessments recognize the national movement toward 21st century skills. They are shifting these assessments to focus more on problem solving rather than rote memorization. The world of work is no longer an isolated environment. Teams are formed to handle complex processes that are critical to the success of the company they're working for. Students must practice the skills necessary to operate in such a group. Miscommunication is one of the biggest barriers to success in any organization. The ability to communicate your thoughts and ideas as part of a team is essential. Young people communicate all the time, but not always in a format that is beneficial for their future success. In the current economic culture, it has been stated that America's strength lies in its creativity, demanding the ability to innovate beyond our current knowledge. Creativity must be practiced and cultivated within the learning process. The quality of life for our children will be dependent upon the primary to 20 educational system and its ability to prepare students to lead in research, development, and innovation. The final key in the developing process is taking the time to reflect. Our students need to reflect on what was done, 
what was accomplished, and what direction to go next. It is through reflection that we grow and move to the next stage effectively. Without reflection, we are likely to repeat mistakes, lose direction, or miss opportunities. So, after researching literally tens of different definitions for 21st century learning, we, the Midland Public Schools, present to you, our community, the nine components that we believe are most critical in teaching these learning skills to our students and your children. We believe that when one thinks about rigorous content and curriculum, the importance of habits of success, the importance of engaging and relevant curriculum, technology integration, thinking critically, collaborating, communicating, and focusing on creativity and reflection that we can have our students well prepared to address the challenges of the 21st century learning. Well, good evening again. Uh, first, I do want to um, thank Carl for the invitation to be here and be a part of this discussion. And it is indeed a pleasure for me to be here. I've been in the Midland community for um, over 30 years, um, and I see some familiar faces out there in the audience. I think that it speaks volumes for a community that shows a caring and concern and a commitment to children. And I think that your presence here tonight definitely speaks volumes about who we are as a community in Midland, that we're committed to quality education, that we're committed to success, and that we're committed to, it, to innovation. I do have the um, pleasure of introducing a very esteemed and knowledgeable panel who will share with you their thoughts and insights on the topic of 21st century learning. And I'd like to introduce them to you now. I think that each of you may have gotten some information um, it speaks to the panel participants, so I am not going to go through detailed bios. I'm just going to introduce them and ask them to come on stage. First person who will be on our panel tonight is Mr. Joe Asiel. He is the CEO of MyTech and president of the Mid-Michigan Innovation Center. And next we have Kathy Ellison. She is associate superintendent of curriculum for Midland Public Schools. We have Jean Marabito, and Jean comes to us tonight from the University of Michigan. We're so glad that she was able to join us. She's Executive Director for Student Affairs in the College of Engineering at the University of Michigan. Go Blue. <laughs> Next we have Mr. Greg Rogers, who's President of Mid-Michigan Medical Center in Midland. And last, and of course not least, Mr. Rich Wells, who's Vice President and Site Director for Michigan Operations at the Dow Chemical Company. And welcome, let's give them a hand. Now before we get started with the questioning of the panel, I do want to just share with you what our process will be tonight. Uh, I am going to ask the panel to share their insights and give us some inputs on some questions that we'll pose to them. And then we'll turn to you as our uh, community and our audience members and we will ask and pose some questions to you and ask you to come up and speak to sharing your inputs and insights about um, the questions that we pose. And I'll share those with you later. And then we'll uh, wrap up with our panel, giving some final thoughts. And then we'll talk about the next steps. And we're working to um, move this process along. I think one of our panelists said that um, something was happening at 9 o'clock that they were trying to get home for. <laughs> All right. So let's get started just uh, with our questioning. The first question I'm going to pose to the panel, and uh, feel free to answer in any order that uh, you like. What attitudes, aptitudes, and skills are needed for the 21st century workplace? I guess we'll start down here. Um, when I thought about this question, I think, uh, it, it, to me, it's, it's, you got to look at it holistically. And I see three, three major parts. And 
The first one is curriculum, uh, which is this, this question addresses. Um, but you also have to look at how that curriculum is delivered. And, and you also have to look at, I think, the culture in which all this is put together. And, and the school can certainly work on the first two. Uh, the third culture is something that everybody in this room, and I think as we get out, I, I, I can give some more thought. But I'm, in terms of the curriculum itself, um, the answer I would give tonight to this group, to this community, is much different than if I was out at, at, at other parts of the United States. Because you look at the statistics that Carl quoted us, this, this is a, a community and a school system that does very well, particularly in the area of science, technology, engineering, and mathematics, STEM education. And that's what we're looking for, our, our um, employees that come to us that have a very good understanding of that, um, have a passion for that, um, because those are our problem solvers. Those are our people that are going to innovate and develop the problems that are going to help society. And when you're solving society's problems, you're also advancing society. Um, so in this, in this place, I think in, in, in this school, we've got to supersize that. And we can go above that by getting on some of the other skills, um, some of the softer skills, um, in particular things like leadership. We also, although we want very strong science um, uh, employees that come to us or students that come to us, we also want them to be able to take that knowledge um, and lead to getting in some place. So applying is, uh, is very, very important. And that comes about through people who are strong leaders, people who are willing to take risks. And so, um, you know, extracurricular activities really help build those sort of things. Um, and just one other, one other point I'd make is this is very much a global world now. And it's very important that people understand what it means to be in a global environment. So, so training, school, schooling around that area, particularly foreign languages, I think are very important. Someone, we're, we're on the phone around the world every day. And we're talking to people in China, we're talking to people in Germany, we're talking to people in South America. And they all have a cultural difference and a cultural viewpoint that is different. If you understand that much, much better and broader, you're going to be much more successful and get us those results. Okay. Thanks. Yeah, I looked at this from the uh, perspective of healthcare, and healthcare, like a lot of industries, is very complex. And you know, we have a variety of people working in the organization that will range from people that need a high school education to people that require four years of college, four years of medical school, and up to six years or more of a residency. So they're almost spending more time post high school than they are in the, uh, in the high school curriculum. And when I was talking, thinking about the attitudes and aptitudes and skills that are, are necessary, I kind of went back and looked at the values that we have as a, uh, a healthcare system in Michigan Health and that we hold up for our employees, and those were excellence, integrity, teamwork, and accountability. And when we, we're looking at the type of people we want, we're looking for people that strive for excellence and have the ability to solve problems, that they have the critical thinking skills necessary to apply the learning that they've acquired uh, to help in real life situations and take better care of our patients. <coughs> and also, healthcare is so complex right now that no one person can do that alone. If you're admitted into the hospital, you're a patient, you probably have a team of a minimum of 12 to 15 people that are taking care of you. So the ability to work together and work collaboratively is a very important quality that uh, we're looking for in employees and actually in the clinical areas is an absolute necessity. You know, we need strong interpersonal, written, oral, and uh, social skills to make sure that they can collaborate with their colleagues. And since we provide care around the clock, it's very important that you're very clearly able to communicate and document so that we can provide the best patient care possible because you're taking care of that patient with colleagues that you might never see. And we always stress a lot of documentation and make sure they're good uh, communication skills. One thing we always struggle with is that the letters U and R are not words. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we've also been putting a new information system, so literacy with computers and other information technologies is also important. You know, they have to be able to have the ability to acquire um, information so they can do the jobs better and be able to acquire that information from a variety of sources. You know, and as Rich was saying, we're looking for well-rounded people. It isn't all about test scores and grades. We're, we're looking for people that have been involved in extracurricular activities. So, you know, in summary, we're, you know, we're looking for employees that are accountable, take responsibility for their actions, and will take pride in their work. You know, people who can stand on their own two feet and uh, continue to learn throughout their careers. 
First of all, I want to uh, congratulate all of you in the audience. I mean, the quality of the education in Midland and the community spirit I see here is pretty amazing. So I just wanted to say that from Ann Arbor. So. Um, <laughs> but what, what we do at the university level is really open possibilities for students. So I want to talk a little bit about what our students come to us with. So when you're 18 years old and what you come what students come to us with, and then I'll talk a little bit about some of the skills which really dovetail almost exactly with what uh, the Board of Education and the Midland Public Schools are talking about. So our students come, they, they want to imagine possibilities, they want to explore, and they want to create. So sound familiar to some high school students? That's kind of where you are too, I think. They're really talented. They want to have an impact. They want to have a social impact. Um, they want to change the world. However you want to say that, I think it's important. A lot of our students come <coughs> wanting to solve the big problem. So whether it's healthcare or it's sustainability or it's energy, they want to help solve those issues. Um, they're creative. They're very good with, in college of engineering particularly, they can go from the design process to building and testing and then maybe get a patent for what they built at the end of the day. And they work in teams. So teamwork is essential, whether it's in or out of the classroom. So what are those skills that prepare students for the workplace, You know, prepare them to go on to graduate school, whatever their path may be? I think innovation is number one. Um, creativity and creative problem solving and lateral thinking, whatever you want to call that, I think that that is key to being successful. Um, you have to have really incredible written and oral communication skills, so pushing that, because some people aren't comfortable with some of the oral presentation skills, I think that's very important. Obviously, you need to be literate for this digital age, and most high school students are much more literate than I will ever be, so I think that is usually not a problem. But giving the students the access and incorporating the technology into their education more strongly is really important. Um, teamwork, global awareness, some things that have already been said, and being socially conscious. I think those are things that are all key to really a successful employ a, a success in life, essentially, so thank you. Uh, first of all, thank you, Carl, for inviting us to be here tonight, and uh, thank you, thanks to each of you for showing this kind of interest in your education system. Uh, you know, as part of MyTech Plus, we go around and we actually benchmark best practices. Uh, we engage a number of different communities, and uh, you know, nowhere do we see this type of engagement at uh, this type of level in, in this community really here, so, so thank you for that. Uh, on September 23rd of last year, my foundation as a nuclear engineer was shaken. And uh, some Swiss physicists took some new neutrinos you know, from Switzerland, and they shot them over to Italy. They put them through a 450 foot, 450 mile long pipe, and they got there 0.2 seconds faster than the speed of light. And uh, all through my training as a nuclear engineer, I know E equals MC squared, and the speed of light was a constant, and never could be exceeded. Well, that got us through the 20th century very well. <laughs> but what possibilities does this open up for the 21st century? And so, you know, I'd like to ask you the same question around education. What are the possibilities? What has, what's been learned in the, uh, you know, 20th century or even in uh, this century? You know, we're 12 years into the 21st century, and what's different about education, what's different about our world that uh, we need to learn from. And uh, that's what MyTech Plus does. We're out there we're benchmarking, we're looking for best practices, we're looking across the U.S. Uh, fortunately, uh, thanks to my last job, I had a, a pretty good global perspective of uh, what was going on there. And so, uh, taking all that into account, that we have found what we consider best practices. And uh, we found one school model. Uh, in fact, we found a lot of best practices that were individual, one-off, uh, excellent successes. 
But we found one model that had been uh, very successful and had been re replicated about 100 times now. And so that's uh, the, the model that Carl referred to earlier. But the components of that are first and foremost is content mastery. And that's what we value. I have uh, three children, two have been through the Midland Public Schools, and I have one that's in 11th grade right now. And the Midland Public Schools excel at that. And for that, uh, I'm very thankful, and we should not compromise on that. Uh, important to uh, today's world is critical thinking. There's as much uh, misinformation out there in our world today as there is information. And so it's important for our kids to be able to take in all the information available to them, draw the right conclusions, and act on those. And so uh, I think that's very important in the workplace. Um, along with that are the communication skills. If you think about how you take in knowledge and learning in your life, you do it through oral communications and through written communications. And that's essential to learn. You know, if you have an 800 word vocabulary versus a 2300 word vocabulary, think of the advantage that the uh, advanced learner has uh, in that situation. Uh, uh, and, and uh, the, you know, the teamwork is critical. All the brilliant minds, and we have lots of them in our schools and uh, in our workplaces, um, you know, we've proven over and over again that, that teamwork can deliver far better results than the sum of individual team members. So that's critical. Uh, the, uh, and I guess what I'll end with is, is the uh, uh, STEM education. I, you know, I, I don't want to de-emphasize any other aspects of education. I love the arts. I love the, you know, the liberal arts, language arts, and things like that. And we have to do good at those. But the area that we're really falling behind on that's important to our workplace is the STEM, which is science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. And uh, so whatever we do going forward in Midland Public Schools, I think uh, needs to take that into account and deliver our, uh, you know, to our, our kids a, a gift, a lifelong gift of uh, you know, an advantage in STEM education, all the attributes that this panel has mentioned so far. Right. Kathy, would you like to answer this question? I would. And first, let me thank you for friends and colleagues up here in the front, some of whom are just meant. I really like the supersizing STEM. I think I've written that down because I think that's cool. Um, as one of the top employers, one of the top five employers in the Midland, uh, Midland Public Schools kind of forms, serves two purposes up here. One, as an employer. And really, we would love to hire people who have all these attributes that everyone's been talking about. And uh, that would work for us well. And particularly the issue, I think, where you might have maybe some need would be for this cultural piece. Because as a rule in schools, so not really as a rule, but sometimes we tend to hire our own. We like that, we grow our own. But if we also need to find ways for them to be that culturally and socially conscious in that cultural kind of global world. So I think that's very important. But for us tonight, I'm inviting all of you to come and um, help us really see if, we're, if we've hit the mark in our PowerPoint with these communication, collaborations, and you could see in what we've been talking about, this has been going on for 10 years. Joe and I were trying to remember when the very first committee got started. And it got started because of some community business people who felt we weren't really doing as well as we could with career technical ed. And we've been on this road for some time, and um, we, we in schools in Michigan are required annually to look at our schools and ask, are we effective? The problem is, what is our test for effectiveness? Because often it's just the mute test or some test that doesn't really test all of these other things. And we come focused on those uh, tests at which enter a score, which doesn't really tell us all about the collaboration, the ability to work together, and those kinds of things. So that test uh, originally, and if we look back, and I think it is important to ask yourselves a key question for schools, which is what is our purpose in all of this? Originally, way back even before I was born, schools were designed to make sure that we had an informed electorate so that our democracy could be successful. That worked for many, many years, but eventually along came the Industrial Revolution, and that was the really big first shift in schools. We shifted into creating schooling that prepared people for 
work in that industrial <coughs> time. And in fact, we haven't really changed a whole lot beyond then, but that is something that we see now as something that is really important to do. So schools have shifted. They've become a place where lots of social problems are invested, where we try to help people with things. So we're very busy places. But in these past few years, when we have been working with our partnerships, and we have had a key insight, which is that students need to be involved more in, in their own education. They need to be more responsible, feel more invested. And you've heard that from people here talking about relevance and about problem solving. And we need to move from giving content to actually engaging with students in those kinds of activities. And we have several programs which has moved us in that direction. Um, the International Baccalaureate may be being one, and certainly looking at a program like NewTek. But we believe, as you saw from the PowerPoint, that these fundamental learning that student do, students do in schools, they have to experience collaboration and communication, technology, uh, usage, critical thinking, and creativity and problem solving, real problems. And the more they do those things with real current time businesses, the better off we will be in preparing them to be college and career ready. So you saw our perspective a lot in the PowerPoint and then hearing what we have to say. But really we would are hoping that tonight we get an opportunity to check are we on the right are we on the right path? And that's what we're here for tonight, to hear from you as well, to say, are we really looking at the right things? And so we're really excited about hearing your answers to the coming questions as well. Thank you. Our panelists have told us that we're looking for global collaborative problem solvers, especially those who are in STEM, who can demonstrate excellence in their leadership, through high integrity, through a willingness to be accountable and responsible, who have the ability to communicate and use technology to solve some of our very, very large social problems that we have uh, in the world today. Now I have a second question for the panel, and that is, what is it that Midland Public Schools does that we should be sure to continue, and what do we need to improve? I think you and I talked again about the three, the three components of the three legs of a, of a stool that are required for good education. And the, the second one is delivery. And I think that, that's an area that, that fits this from my perspective. The delivery, of course, starts with the teachers, but it isn't all on the teachers, and we have, we have to recognize that. But you have to make sure the teachers are, are of a quality, that they want to expand their knowledge, they want to understand better delivery systems. You know, one of the problems that we don't have in Midland Public Schools but we do have globally, just uh, in the middle schools uh, in America, 70% uh, of the students are taught math by a teacher that is not educated in math. And if you go to the rest of the world, the numbers are reversed, where 70% of the students are taught by a math teacher. Someone who's taught. We don't have that problem in Midland, and, and Carl and, and the board continue that, because that's very important. That helps build a passion in a child, and they, and they learn much better in that, that case. Um, and, and, and to build on something, I think uh, teachers that have a diversity of thought, a diversity of opinion, can, can bring some real life experience. Again, you talked about rote learning, um, memorization, that's how a lot of us learn. Um, and, and some of us learn that way today. But you find when you learn that way, you don't retain it anywhere near when you develop a passion for something. And having a teacher who can really help you build that passion will help you uh, remember things. That's why my son knows everything about every NFL football player there is, is because he's got this passion for that. Um, and then for the school system itself, um, then it's developing this delivery toolbox because there is no one size fits all. It's going to depend on what, what curriculum you're after, what specialty you're after, the culture of the town, um, how the students work, but you have to build that, that toolbox. And I think Midland Public Schools has started to do that but needs to, needs to go farther. You know, the first thing, the International Baccalaureate, um, is a great program, and we're, we're at Dow, we're proud to have been able to sponsor that and, and keep that alive. Um, uh, I've seen that in my own student, my own kids who, who've taken IB classes. But we need to go beyond that and, and do things like new tech. I'm, I'm very excited about the potential for new tech. Again, as a tool, not as, not as the whole toolbox, but as a tool. 
because that teaches things like collaboration. You're learning, but you're also learning those soft skills, those social skills. You learn when it's right to be a leader and get things done, but you also learn when it's time to be a team player, and that's, that's very important um, in, in the real world. Um, you know, things like internships, getting more exposure um, to real life experiences, as we talked about. Uh, you know, one of the one of the biggest transitions that, that we make when we go from the academic world to the professional world is, in academics, also often the answer is right or wrong. It's, it's on or it's off. In, in the real world, it's rarely that that cut and dry. Sometimes we have to make decisions, or all the time, we have to make decisions with 70% of the data and 70% of the confidence. And, and parts of the toolbox that you can deliver that skill to people, that when it's right, to take the risk and make the right decision and then move forward. So again, I think it's, it's really around delivery and in particular getting that toolbox and getting the teachers trained that toolbox so they know to use what tools in the, in, in the right situation. I think uh, my wife Candy and I had uh, three sons that are products of middle public schools and they graduated from college and are all gainfully employed. Um, and while we're still waiting for one of them to buy us dinner for the first time, <laughs> we do think pretty highly of the school system. So I do think the Midland Public Schools um, are proud to be from Midland. Uh, we actually use it when we're recruiting positions. We use that as a recruitment tool because that's something our community has um, that we think uh, makes us different than, uh, than other communities. You know, it is a uh, far different world uh, now than what, what it was when I um, graduate from high school. You know, I've had, I basically in my career worked for two different companies. A lot of our children will probably work for at least 10 different companies. So it's going to be important that they're able to adapt to uh, the changing situations. And I think with, you know, some of the things that, that Rich talked about uh, that we can do uh, for our teachers. You know, it's, there's, we're preparing our kids to work in industries that we probably don't know even that even exists right now. We don't know anything about them. Carl mentioned that um, in his PowerPoint presentation. I just look in healthcare and the things that we're doing now that didn't even exist there, uh, 10 years ago, and the skills that people need to be able to uh, to take care of patients. It's you know employability is important, uh, and that's we you know we've talked a lot about that. But I think for the schools, it's got to be about values and citizenship. Uh, also, they, they need to be good members um, of our community. I, we are, uh, I see that we are doing some things in the school system as far as and what Kathy mentioned with uh, you know, partnering with business. And I, I get a sense that there's a real thirst for this from a lot of the teachers in the, um, in the school system. You know, at the hospital, we're working on inviting some of the science teachers into the hospital so they can observe firsthand the diagnostic procedures and you know, how science is applied in the, uh, in the treatment of uh, diseases, and that's been very popular with them. I know some other business, I know now, is involved with doing things like that too, but it seems to be uh, a real thirst for that from our teachers. So the more real world examples or educational opportunities that we can provide, I think the better overall educational experience we're going to give to our, our students. So, you know, I think, uh, is this forum is a testament to that, you know, it's different than it was, we need to change going forward. And I also would be supportive of the, uh, the new tech uh, concept. I think that, that uh, has some uh, really very outstanding qualities in it. I think one thing I'd like to say is to continue to prepare your students academically as you have. I think um, it's incredible the quality, the IB program is an example. But I think, I mentioned before, um, the opportunity to open possibilities to different types of students and students who learn differently. I think the project-based um, emphasis at something like New Tech is great. That's really how we do a lot of the teaching and learning in the College of Engineering. Um, it's project-based, project it's driven by possibly industry or healthcare or by a developing country that needs something and I think um, that our students come alive with that. And I'll give you an example. Um, I, I started an outreach program in Detroit, and it's with robotics teams from Detroit Public Schools. And you know their graduation rates are nothing like yours. Their average ACT scores are nothing like yours. 
but you get 175 students into a room with professional engineers and students from the College of Engineer mentoring them. And they're working to build a robot together. And all of a sudden, you see excitement, you see collaboration, you see teamwork, and it's all around this project. And it's all around the teamwork that they're doing, and you watch people jockey to be the leader and not the leader, and it's really exciting work. So I've seen it in action with students who otherwise do not get excited about STEM at all. So I think that's an example of, of what really can happen at a, you know, and, and here I think the possibilities are way higher than what I experienced in Detroit. Um, I think, you know, we create these unique opportunities for students and that has to happen, but we have to step back and let our students, both at the high school and university level, reflect on what they're doing. You know, they, they need to really think about why did I do that? What has it done for me? How has it built me as a human being? Or where will it take me? And I think those are really important. I think um, it's been mentioned, but diversity and infusing global awareness into education is critically important. And I know you do that to a great extent, but that could be expanded, I think. Um, I think it, it is really, really important. When employers come to interview our students, that's one thing they're looking for. They're looking for international experiences or exposure in foreign languages, all of those things. And um, our dean actually has a goal that everyone in the College of Engineering, 100%, will have some kind of international experience before he or she graduates. So it's key to our success, and I think it's also key here. Um, and I guess the biggest thing is just to encourage that creativity in students. Um, to continue to do that because I think something that's project-based does give you an opportunity to be really creative and think about it. Um, and not just the project-based piece, but you could be creative in, in a traditional classroom as well. And I think that's key to develop that creativity. Um, and it crosses all boundaries. It's not, in engineering we have students who are taking art classes and music classes and a third of the marching band at Michigan are engineers. So there's a lot of creativity. You know, there's a lot of crossover between the arts and engineering, and I think it's pretty amazing to watch that happen. I want to take a pause because we have mentioned, you know, Carl mentioned New Tech uh, in his introduction, and I know that the panel has uh, talked about that a bit. And I'm going to just turn to Joe and ask if you could just give us a brief um, a synopsis of new tech for the uh, those in the audience who may not be familiar. Sure, I'd be glad to do that. Uh, first of all, it's a transformational model. It's not something that you actually do uh, incrementally. But it, 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 it takes you know the standards, the rigor, and the requirements of the state and all the uh, you know academic requirements, and it builds on that a whole culture of uh, of experiential learning. And uh, it starts with, uh, you know, one grade at a time. So you actually take one grade and you go through, uh, first of all, the teachers prepare. And, uh, you know, rather than one, uh, you know, kid learning about dinosaurs three years in a row with, a, with an uncoordinated program, you actually collaborate and put all these projects together so that all the requirements for learning are built upon and the, the students discover and research and learn these things as they progress through the four grade, four grades. So it starts with the teachers, uh, they're forward thinking, it's all project based. But here's the difference, and uh, uh, it's <coughs> business is uh, systemically integrated with it. And so rather than the teacher come in and say, okay, here's your homework and your problem for the day, and uh, you need to turn it in tomorrow and I'll grade it. Business actually comes in and says, look, uh, and I'll give you an example. We saw in Indiana, Pfizer came in and said, here's a polymer that we need to develop for one of our drugs. And these have these kinds of characteristics. And so they went to a chemistry class and they prepared a job scope and said, this is, is what we need to learn and collaborate with the teacher. And they introduced a project like that. And then uh, industry you know, stepped out of the classroom and the kids were sitting around talking about what they know already, but what do they need to know? They didn't know where to start. And the teacher automatically became a resource to them and a facilitator and a partner and an advocate going through this process. 
And then industry worked with them. They were there by phone. Uh, they come into the classroom. They work with them, bring experts in these fields, research. You know, experts bring real time best knowledge into the, the classroom and work collaboratively under the, the you know, teacher's uh, uh, guidance so that the, the students could learn and they could pull information. And uh, they would go through this process working together as a team. They divided into three or four, uh, you know, student teams. And uh, at the end of uh, uh, three weeks, you know, after they had gone through and, and went through their rubric and, and learned what they needed to, they actually came up with solutions that uh, the company took back and actually went and uh, implemented. So, uh, you know, companies can get real benefit out of this. The community can get real benefit out of this. At the same time, the students, uh, just like the robotics that you described, it's in every class I visited. Every student's engaged. It's not because they're listening to a lecture. It's because they're working in it together as teams. They're discovering, they're learning, they're Skyping, they're on Facebook, they're, uh, you know, they have uh, rigorous knowledge databases that they're going to. Not, everything's not Wikipedia or uh, Google. <laughs> so they have actual resources that they will go, go to. And uh, it, it's just inspiring. And not only that, at the end of the, the project, they give a presentation. So by the time they get through their four years of school, uh, the students have given over 120 presentations. And I can go and sit down and talk with any of these students by the end of their freshman year. In fact, they put them up in panels just like this, and there's 20 or 30 of us sitting out there. And they're able to answer questions as, as good or if not better than we do. And uh, you can see the teamwork, the enthusiasm, and uh, the real benefits of it. It's a high school program. It is. It's a high school program. Oh, what did I say? Mm -hmm. Okay. Oh, you said dinosaurs. Oh, yeah, okay. <laughs> oh, good point. <laughs> oh, but just speaking of that, another example, I walked into a, an anatomy class, so this is 11th and 12th graders, and, and I asked them what they're working on. So I, I saw a team there, and uh, uh, they said, we asked our own questions to learn anatomy. And they said, why does hair grow on the top part of your hand and not on the bottom? And they said, why do I get a brain freeze when I drink an icy? And they always said, uh, how about these uh, murderers? What's different about their brain? And things like that. So they develop their own questions. And they go out and research these things and, and uh, discover them. In uh, other classes, they're building things. They're creating things. Um, you know, the, the Napa Valley uh, in California, they built their own cistern system. So they actually designed and built it to collect rainwater since water is extremely precious out there. And they use that, they put in all electronic timers, and, and they water their lawns with it. So, uh, this is fascinating. So, I'm, I'm well excited about it. Another interesting piece is that they recommend between the four and 500 student body with yes. four grade levels. Yes, yes, exactly. So, is there kind of a small number? And they team teach as well. And, uh, <coughs> does that answer your question? It does. I hope everyone has a, a better understanding of new tech. So. I'm, I'm uh, work in the chemical industry, so I know we have a lot of acronyms and terms that we use, and I'm always very conscious that um, everybody has a good understanding of um, um, the kinds of terms that we're using. So I appreciate you uh, sharing that, Joe. And so um, I'll, I'll turn back to Kathy and uh, ask her to share what she thinks um, Middle Public School does well and some areas where we might be able to improve. Well, I, I certainly am what everyone else has said and say that we believe that over the years our, our data has always proven that we excel at really giving the content to the students that they need and having the thinking skills to really solve a lot of problems. A lot of what we've talked about here, we do partially and we certainly could improve and we do very well on things. Our robotics team is kind of what you described, I have stopped by in the afternoons out of our, at uh, the Franklin Center where they are in our our group of mentors are so excited about what they did. And then I think if not last Saturday, the Saturday before we had to kick off with the first uh, competition, which was very exciting. So it isn't that we aren't doing some of these things, but we certainly could extend more. So our content would be certainly our hallmark, and we don't want to give that up. I um, think that also something else we've done well, and maybe tonight is an example of that, is reach out to our community always. And, always might be in over, but we do talk about it always. You know, can we collect any input from our community? When we close our buildings, we have a committee. I mean, we're known for committees. 
And so we like to be with our community because I think, going back to my first answer, saying that, you know, how do we judge our success? Well, we judge our success when our community feels we're reaching their needs. You know, obviously we can't do everything for everyone, but we try hard to do that. And I would put that in the cards to say, we want to continue to always reach out and hear what the community has to say about things and in whatever ways we can. I think another uh, place I wanted to mention that was the last time I was in this room was when Dick Delinsky kicked off the Youth Master Plan. We're integral into the Youth Master Plan. We work on the Youth Master Plan as well. We're there, we work with community agencies. We reach out in any way that we can to support our families and students. So I would put that in also the place where we want to continue to do that. Um, places where we might do uh, better would be to try harder to continue our dialogues. We never really have enough of that and um, make sure that we take every opportunity to believe in, to uh, listen to our community and to follow that. Work with our legislators. Great to see that John Molnar is here tonight to hear this conversation. And Kevin Cotter. And Kevin Cotter, right, Joe? See, it's hard to see with the lights. But thank you both for coming because, as Carl mentioned earlier, education is certainly being uh, controlled by agents outside of just the teachers. And so we know that legislatures, uh, foundations, and others are impacting us. So it's good to have you here as well. And something else we could, could maybe do would be wise to include you more in those kinds of uh, efforts as well. So I put those in that. Uh, you also saw all of the things on the PowerPoint that we mentioned. So I don't want to go back over those, but working more with our businesses is certainly high on our list. And just last week, we actually had a wonderful meeting with the hospital again, reaching out to try to break even some new ground with our staff members. We had three or four staff members there, teachers there, who were working to see how we could partner more realistically and create more realistic project-based units, even in non-traditional classes. I'd like to add one uh, additional thing. First of all, the IB program, I mean, that's outstanding. It sets high standards for, for our students and our classes. But there's one thing that hasn't been mentioned here, and that's, uh, that, you know, Midland Public Schools provides a safe learning environment for our kids. And uh, a couple of us visited a school in Chicago uh, last month. It is a STEM school. And uh, we, we spoke with the students. And uh, one of the students was telling us how he has to cross game boundaries in order to get to school. And uh, so, I mean, he literally put his life in jeopardy every day so that he could go pursue this STEM education. And so it might be something that we take for granted in this community, but it's something that's highly sought after uh, by other people in our own country. This isn't a third world country, it's right here in the United States. So thank you for that safe work environment learning environment. So we've heard um, many things that Midland Public Schools do, do well. Uh, IP program, the um, AP program, a safe learning environment. And I appreciate you bringing that up because I think that many times um, we do take things for granted um, when it's not a part of uh, what our experience is. I had an opportunity to go into a STEM school in Tennessee, down in Nashville, and um, there was a good interface between that school and Vanderbilt University. And it was a high school. And one of the things that they talked about was when the students first came in, it was an inner city school. When the students first came in, um, no one wanted to take their coat off, and no one wanted to put their backpacks down. And so just to get to the point where the students felt safe with each other, and had developed relationships, and really were able to engage. And we were there in the spring, so that was what they had experienced early on when the students came together. But I think it's just um, a good point to make that um, it's great that we do have that in this community. We've talked about sort of shifting the role of the teacher. You know, in the new tech program, you mentioned teacher being more of a facilitator, a guide, a resource uh, for students more experiential learning, and the business integration in the curriculum, as well as, I would add, relevance. Uh, you know, just thinking through how many times do uh, students come home and say, I'm not sure why I'm learning what I'm learning, because they don't see the relevance uh, as it pertains to when am I ever going to use this again, which I think does speak to project-based learning also. 
uh, encouraging uh, creativity, um, diversity, global awareness, uh, culture, foreign language. We talked about project-based learning and making sure that we make the spaces for students <coughs> who learn differently. Uh, we talked about adaptability, and I think that we did get high marks for teachers' preparedness and rigor rigorous curriculum, but also teaching the values of citizenship. Um, and once again, that application, especially science application, uh, with real-world examples. Um, and Rich brought up um, sort of this willingness to take risk, which is uh, really important. That the fact that in the real world, we don't have 100% um, knowledge all the time, and so you may have 60, 70 percent, and you've got to make a decision in not only um, understanding that, but having the willingness and having the habit and the ability to be able to do that. Um, we talked about tool toolbox. I think that speaks to diversity again. You know, not having uh, sort of one size um, fit all, and uh, basically being open to um, growth and change, and recognize that um, we're in a changing environment. And you know, just to hear Rich uh, talk about how, um, or I, I think it was great, talk about how in the last 10 years just the technology has changed at the hospital. That there are things that you're using today that didn't even exist 10 years ago. And there's things that, I mean, we didn't have iPhones, iPads. Mm -hmm. We didn't have a lot of things 10 years ago. Mm -hmm. you know, I think we're afraid to move into the year 2000 <laughs> 12 years ago. So. Um, I think the other point that was mentioned too, um, diversity of thought and opinion, but also this concept of helping students to find their passion was also part of what we talked about. And just and I'm, I'm sort of listed some things just so that in reflection we can think through what are those things that we're doing very well, how are we delivering that, and then what are some things that we could improve and the challenges uh, that we face in, with regard to that improvement. So now. We want to turn to you, our audience, and ask for your inputs and your insights. And I have three questions that were provided by um, Middle Public Schools, and I want to share them with you. Now, they, they um, have told me they were not able to project these on the screen, so if you've got uh, something uh, to write with, I'd ask that you write these down and reflect on these a bit as you come forward. The first question was, what attri attributes make students stand out in hiring or in the admissions process based on comments that you've heard or experiences that you've had? So the attributes that make students stand out either in the hiring or the application process. We'd like you to give us your thoughts on that. What you believe the challenges are for success in the 21st century workplace? So the second question is, what challenges for success are there in the 21st century workplace? And last, the question that we pose to uh, the panel, what challenges and strengths do you think Midland Public School has in preparing students for post-secondary career in college? And I think we have one mic here. Um, so we'll give you a moment to reflect on that. And I guess if we do have some individuals in the audience who'd like to come forward and share with us their thoughts, their insights, and their inputs on these questions, we'll welcome that at this time. Hi, uh, my name is, is Mike Sarchik. Um, I have a background in engineering and finance. Uh, so math is, is very important to me. And so I, I think about what the school does. Um, I have an eighth grade daughter right now who's going through this week, figuring out what math curriculum she's going to be taking in high school. So it's very interesting, it's very exciting. I have a, a fifth grade daughter who is figuring out what math curriculum she's going to be taking in middle school. And that's very interesting and exciting. And I have a first grader who's in rocket math and figuring out where he wants to be. As a parent of these three kids, I'm worried about my first grader thinking about his college math education. And, and I think the school does a very good job in a lot of these areas. And, and obviously, the curriculum is there. Um, but I see our teachers faced with having to deliver on a rubric and delivering on this requirement and this requirement and this requirement. 
And how do we use technology? How do we improve the process so that we can uh, find ways to let the teachers focus on these interpersonal skills and other, the other items that, that are discussed here and let the technology work towards solving these problems of teaching one plus one is two and two plus two is four. So I, to, to respond back to that question, I think the schools are, are trying very hard to meet these challenges, but um, it, 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 it's, there, there's a lot to do yet and, and a lot that we can do to utilize technology to our advantage in this process. So and, and it's the first time hearing the my tech pro or the new tech program tonight, and uh, that sounds very interesting and compelling as well. So and, and thank you also to, to Kim and all the panelists for being here tonight. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. It's hard to be the first one up. <laughs> we know enough people will start calling on the film. Oh, good. <laughs> <laughs> I could share an example that, that addresses math. I thought it was fascinating when we were out in Africa. California, which was the very first new tech, we had to walk in on a math physics class, and they could find these classes like this, and they would they trebuchet, so they're shooting objects from here back to the end of the uh, auditorium, and, and they're doing pretty good at it, but uh, we walked uh, in, in the classroom, and the, the teacher was up there writing on the board and showing stuff, and we asked them what they're doing, he said, well, I use this to teach them mathematics. So well, how did you do that? He said, well, first of all, we let them try to hit the object back there without any calculations, and they were all over the place. And he said, uh, well, then I gave them some equations, a set of equations to solve. And they spent two and a half days solving all these equations, and they got, you know, pretty close. And they said that, that he, the, the students came back and said, there's got to be an easier way to do this. He said, aha, let me teach you matrices. And so that's what the new tech model is all about, is creating this desire within students to learn, rather than just find the mechanics of, of how you solve matrices. I'm Dr. Shelley Jones. I'm a small business owner um, in Midland, and I'm a practicing dentist. Um, I have seven children, and three have graduated from the Midland Public School system for our students. Um, recently, two of my daughters um, both graduated from college with their bachelor's degree. Um, they think they're done with college. <laughs> they're not done. They haven't figured that out yet. They're still trying to find jobs that will give them paychecks to earn enough money to live off of. Fortunately, no one's moved back home yet, but um, they're not done. Which bring, brings me to my, to my point. Um, I think for our students to be successful in the 21st century, um, as we were told, the world is changing and they're going to be um, employed in careers and jobs that we don't even know exist yet. My third graders, who knows what they're going to be? Probably some awesome thing that I've never even thought of. Um, so I, I would propose um, a paradigm shift in the way we, we approach children about education. Since we know that we're preparing children for careers that do not yet even exist, they need to be introduced to the ideas of lifelong learning. Education does not have a finite end anymore. People need to adapt to the idea that they may need to re-educate or augment their education even after college graduation. Work and education are not mutually exclusive and acquiring new skill sets will be necessary for ongoing success in their careers. Even as a small business owner, I have needed to embrace technologies that I was never exposed to during my education. And I think often our students, especially um, as they get towards the end of high school, um, they may have an idea of what they want to do. They may have even counted up the years. Four more years of school and I'm done. Six more years, eight more years, whatever that magic number is in their head. And um, it never um, really occurs to them that Many, many people, I, I don't know the statistics, but a lot of people actually 
change careers sometime during the course of their lifetime. And um, I think if we can teach our children that um, education isn't going to end when you walk out of the doors of whatever institution you're going to, um, you have to be flexible and ready to adapt both to the economy um, and to whatever your, your chosen vocation is going to be. You're going to have to be ready to change and adapt if you're going to be successful. Yeah. I'd just like to tell you a story about my mother <laughs> and my daughter. Because when my daughter was very, very young, my mother was like the greatest grandmother in the world. She was just constantly playing with my children while I worked. But um, she would say to her, Well, what would you like to be today? And so she would leave, you know, a waitress or whatever, and she would take the Then she would say to her when she was done, well, What do you want to be after that? And what do you want to be after that? And she has grown up thinking that that's how life is. And I'm saying that has to start young with all of us, with our children. And we need to pursue that. Because when we say to them, what are you going to be when you grow up? What message are we sending? We don't mean anything by it, but I think you put your finger on a very, very important thing that might shift the way children think when we all say that to them, whether they're students in school or whether they're children or children are just neighbors children. So I can tell you that my daughter still wonders what I'm going to be after I grow up and she wonders what she'll be next. And it's come from you know my wonderful mother. So yeah. Well and I, I, I will share with you also as I shared with some of my colleagues earlier when we had dinner. Um, I feel very blessed and fortunate because um, some of you may have heard of this assessment tool called the Strength Finder. And on the Strength Finder my um, greatest strength is that a learner. So I'm always um, spending time um, asking questions and uh, reflecting on what did I learn from that. Um, so I think this concept of lifelong learning is very important. Uh, I shared that I've been in the community for 31 years and I've been employed by um, Dow Corning for that period of time. And sort of this concept of um, getting to your passion. I started out working in finance and I think I had about four or five different jobs in finance over a nine year period of time. And at some point I looked around and there were people doing spreadsheets and they seemed very happy doing that. I was not happy doing spreadsheets and budgets. And so I moved into uh, human resources and I worked there for about 20 years and I did a number of different jobs there. And about three years ago I moved into public affairs um, Work. And I think that the point is that, um, one, I do have strength as a learner. I, as I say, I feel very blessed and fortunate to feel like you can sort of morph and change and move, and that's a part of my makeup. But some of that, too, I think speaks to this issue of passion that we talked about. Because some, sometimes where you are and where I thought I was in college and what I started doing, I learned was not my passion. And so over time, I've um, also been trying to align that with the work that I've been doing. So I just wanted to share that with you. And I see Victor here, was it? I think has a comment. Thank you, Kim. Uh, my name is Victor Echimobe. Uh, I've lived in Midland for oh, close to 35 years or so. In fact, the end of this month, I'll be retired from Dow Chemical Company. I haven't worked there for almost 34 years. So. Congratulations. Thank you. I have uh, I have put three kids through the Midland Public Schools, and I I must agree that the Midland Public Schools does a very good job. But I think there are opportunities for improvement, and some of the things that I'm going to say are things that I have shared. Kathy Elson knows knows me, and I've shared some of these in the past, and I I like to offer them again for your consideration. It ties in with this idea of lifelong learning. When I was in school, and I, I'm originally from the country of Ghana in West Africa, we had a program in elementary school and also in the, in the high school where uh, we use, they use what they call the onion approach. So every year you take all the core courses. Say in the science field, you take, I mean, 
the STEM field, you take math, all the different sciences, chemistry, physics, biology, and so on. And every year, and then the next year, you take more advanced versions of it. So you discover it. And one of the things that I found uh, quite, I mean, I, when my kids were going through school, the program that they have in Midland is that one year you take, say, biology, another year you take chemistry, another year you take physics, and so on. And I didn't think it was a very good model, and so I suggested that we perhaps look at the, some different models. And this is what I want to offer again. And the reason is, you have kids that are growing, and their interests may change over time, and so on. And so if you teach somebody biology at, let's say, a stage, that person may not appreciate biology, for one thing. But another year, if you, that person would take biology another year, they may appreciate it. And so you miss an opportunity to actually engage that student. Okay, that's one thing. The other thing is that these sciences are all integrated in a way. And so when you teach, when you take all these courses together, you see how they interact with each other and how you can build on each other. And I would like to offer as a, a, a way to look at the curriculum and perhaps think in terms of this approach. I think you're going to find that people are, the students are going to be more engaged and you may actually find more people getting into the sciences and so on because the last thing we want to do is to get somebody turned off from science because they took a course early in their career and they say a biology class or a physics class or whatever, and they said, oh, I don't like science. I think it's, uh, we, do them, we do them really a disservice when we do that. So that's one of the things that I'd like to offer to you to think about. Hi, my name is Jennifer Van Weber, and I live in Bill Gates' neighborhood area. And um, I can tell you that they have been gifted in both places. Tremendously. I'm very thankful for the way that MBS has helped me raise my girls. Um, <clears throat> but in more specifically on an educational basis, in comparing those two districts, or generally a district like a small town in Midland and what's going on in other parts of, of the country, um, out there, I would have to say 95% of the educators in the system starting with kindergarten, not just high school, but elementary and middle school, all those teachers had master's degrees. <clears throat> and um, I've been told time and time again from insiders that a master's degree here in Michigan, here in, in the MPS school district, is a piece of debt in terms of getting hired. Now, I realize that that's a budgetary problem, but I bring this up because what I heard most from the panel of what's needed is kids who need to communicate, cooperate, and have teamwork. So I'm wondering if there can be communication and cooperation and teamwork between the business communities and MPS for funding. Because that's what I saw in that other district. That's why it happened. That's how it happened. And the other market difference that I saw, and although I can say that MPS can do rope educating like nobody's business. Nobody's business. And there was no other place my girls got warm fuzzies than here at MPS. But to prepare our kids for a global world and lifelong learning, which I'm a huge advocate for, um, teaching methods, the innovative teaching methods. We moved here eight years ago and, and back, they were surpassing us like you can't even believe. Still are. The teaching methods are just incredible and exciting. And we haven't even begun to know that they exist here. So I'm wondering if we can step outside this community, this bubble of warm fuzzy, and find out what's going on, because it's amazing. And perhaps funding can come from our business community to help support this system. 
to go find out what's going on and bring it back. It's huge. It's so exciting. So, thank you. Kim, if I, if I could just, just, I appreciate the comments. Just, I don't want to make this an adopt commercial, but Dow recognizes the need to put, put our money where our mouth is a bit. And we, we've, in the last three years, uh, donated over a million dollars to to the public education in the Great Lakes Bay region, and that's something that, that we will continue. And then on top of the financial support, um, we have people within our, our company who work on public policy looking at just answering some of these questions, but on a broader scope, either for the state of Michigan or for the country. And Carrie Hoffman, who's here today, is helping us with that. She is specialized in working on STEM education and how we can take a company that that thrives on the product of good STEM education and help make that even better raw material for us. So we're both financially, but also intellectually um, offering our assistance. And, and we have a great dialogue with, with Carl as well to see where else we can help in both aspects. Also, I would say we, we, yeah, we can, can I just interrupt to you? Allow Rich to relax so he doesn't have to toot Dallas or <laughs> I'd love to do it. One million dollars that he talked about is really over three million in the last seven years. And most recently, as we've begun to explore options for new tech, I, I don't want us to think like we're drinking the new tech Kool Aid tonight necessarily. <laughs> it, it is a great program and it's something we are seriously looking at. But my tech, through contributions from the major corporations and the foundations here in town have allowed some of our staff to travel to Texas, to Napa Valley, um, to Texas again, hopefully, put a little pressure on there, Joe. Uh, we actually have a new tech visit uh, planned for the middle of next month where we're taking some teachers from Middle and High and Dow High School uh, down here in Ann Arbor to Chelsea to do a visit and have our teachers actually visit with teachers of the new tech program to make sure that's a good fit. None of that would have happened without the benefaction, both commercially from the corporations and the foundations here in town. So I wanted to point that out. Yeah. Very, very fortunate in that area. Kathy. I, I just also want to reply and say that we're always looking for schools to connect with. And that doesn't, even though we've heard lots about culture, mm -hmm. um, traveling and so forth, that doesn't mean we couldn't travel to Seattle or make some connections with other schools there to learn. And I'm not sure what our statistics are with master's level teachers, but um, we have lots of teachers with master's degrees. So we might check on that, maybe we can get back with you. Um, but anyway, we would, we're always open to pairing with teachers in other places who have great ideas. Thanks. <coughs> Hi, my name is Colleen Markle, and um, I work at the Michigan Medical Center. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I have been fortunate enough to um, care for patients for 20 years and have recently changed jobs. And I work with a lot of the students through Midland Public School and the health tech program, as well as nurse externs and college interns. So I deal with a lot of students, I interview a lot of students, and I don't claim to be an expert at hiring, but some of the attributes that we look for are um, eye contact and that verbal communication that they've talked about tonight. Um, one of the, my favorite questions to ask, and even interviewing high school students as well as college students just starting out, um, what was your first job and what did you learn from it? because so many of our kids are out there working at such a young age, doing volunteers experience, and they bring that to the interview. And I love hearing those stories. So I guess that's what I have to say about um, the students that I come in contact with at the hospital. Um, I gave a pamphlet out to some of the parents. Anyone that has questions for me regarding students, I'll be more than happy to answer after the program. We appreciate that commercial from Mid Michigan. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Heather Cleland, host, and uh, thank you for all being here. Very excited hearing um, everything that's been said. 
And um, you know, my, I worked at Del Corning five years as an engineer. So I, and then now I've, I've taught at Delta in teaching physics as an adjunct. And, and now I'm a parent of four little boys <laughs> that are in elementary school and in preschool kind of going through the system. So I'm really speaking here as a parent at this point. Um, but I really, in answering the second question, looking at what we need for the second 21st century, we are be facing challenges that you can't fully anticipate in, as we're sending our kids through the education. What exactly will it look like when he, you know, 20 years from now, when he's entering the workforce? I mean, that's, that's quite a ways out. Um, but one of the things that I look at is 25 years ago, when I was in high school, um, I had a, a math class. And in that math class, I was wondering, well, what's the square root of one, of negative one? And the teacher said, you can't do that. And I said, well, seems like everything I've learned in math that you should be able to do this. So we're having this discussion in class. And the, the teacher says, I'll talk to you after class. So I came and I talked to the teacher after class. She said, okay, okay. She writes her square root of negative one equals I. Imaginary number. And I'm like, oh, okay. So this is how you deal with this in math. And I said, you know, that was nice to get that question. But what saddened me, even at that moment as a teenager, was that what I was told was, right after that, don't tell the other students because you'll confuse them. <laughs> and I'm sitting here thinking, one of the things that we did that, in, back then was we said, okay, this is what you need to learn this year. And we're not going to teach you one. And this is what you need to learn next year. And so, and we're going to, so that's how well we've learned beyond that, right? Come to have kids in the fifth grader and a second grader now and comes home with the math problem that's accidentally assigned that had something in it that they weren't supposed to uh, have mastered yet. But they had given the skills that would help them master it. It's a division problem. It had decimals in both parts of it. So it was 35.6 divided by 0.8 or something like that. They were taught how to deal with it being in only one. And this was, well, what do I do, Mom? What do I do about this? And so we worked through how we do it. He went to school. The next day, he had the answer. He was younger. Happy with this, they came back at the end of that day and told me that we don't have to know that yet. <laughs> this isn't part of what we are supposed to learn right now. And I was very sad because I look at it and I say, when he enters and gets into the world, he's going to be faced with questions that somebody thought he didn't need to know how to answer yet. And I think what really excites me about some of the things that were set up here is the open-endedness of the questions. That if the kid is asking the question, that there, this is a time to answer. That kids need to be able to be prepared to answer questions that maybe we aren't supposed to be answering yet. Because that's what they're going to face when they get out there. They're going to get out there and they're going to find I have to take the skills that I have and answer questions I've never answered before. And um, so I, I really, some of the rubric teaching to the test really scares me because we're holding back those questions because, hey, we gotta meet those tests because we need to meet those tests in order to keep our funding to so forth and so on. And in the, in the process, we're losing sight of our kids and their futures. Thanks, Hi, my name is Kim Vander Kellen. I know some on the panel. But my question is for Jean, because bottom line, what our students, once they graduate from MPS, they want to, a lot of them want to go to University of Michigan. Mm -hmm. So we want to know what kind of curriculum is going to prepare them best. We're looking at continuing the IB program for the middle school and the primary school. Do you really value the IB program, or is there a different way that you see we should have? Well, I'll answer yes, we do value the IB program, definitely. Um, but I think there are a lot of different paths that students can take. 
So let me talk a little bit more generally about the attributes we look for in a student through the admission process. Is that Sure. Right. sure. So, obviously, strength of curriculum is important, and strength of curriculum can mean many things, you know. Um, but but we do a lot. We look very closely at what school a student is coming from, and know the schools, and you know, look at the academic profiles of the high schools where our students are coming from. We also, you know, excellent GPAs and test scores are still a piece of what we look at, but we do a holistic review of applications. So it's not just those numbers, it's much more. One is leadership, I think um, we look for leadership in students, leadership opportunities in their activities or on their athletic teams or wherever it may be, but we're also looking for depth in the, those activities. So we don't want some student who has a list of 20 things that he or she is involved in. We want to see that they've been committed and passionate, the word we're using tonight, about something, um, whether it's you know football or it's community service or whatever it is, you know, so that so that they show that they are committed <coughs> to something and they've been in a leadership role in that. I think we look a lot for impact um, of the service students have given to the community. Most students are doing some type of community service community work and uh, when they can articulate the impact that they brought to the community I think that's really important. <coughs> there are some students who don't have the luxury of doing a lot of volunteer work because they have to work um, and so we look at that. I think you need to balance those things because there are some students who aren't as affluent and aren't able to give up that job after school that pays. Um, so I think that's really a key as well. We look at that. Um, but I was talking at dinner a little bit about this, and one real important thing, and I think students and probably a lot of, a lot of us parents and um, family members don't understand the strength and the importance of those essays when they're applying. So what the essay does for us is differentiate that 3.8 student with uh, 30 ACT, and I'm just giving you an example. But if we can hear that student voice and understand the excitement that student has for learning and the excitement that student may have for engineering particularly, because that's who I'm reading applications for, I think that's, that's key. It different, differentiates a student. It shows that they're able to um, tell us their life story, you know, and really that essay can make a student stand out. So I think that's one key that a lot of people take not as seriously as they should. So just to go through, academic excellence, rigor are really important. Leadership and impact, I think, are very important. Um, but demonstrated interest in that field of study and definitely being able to have that student kind of leap off the page in the essays so we can better know them. Because we can't possibly know all the students who have fought. So. so in engineering, maybe more of a STEM, new tech education would be better than the IB, would be more for journalism language arts areas? I, I wouldn't say that. I mean, I think students come with a lot of different avenues. So we have students who go to really small high schools with 60 students in a graduating <coughs> class. They can succeed. You know, a, a student can come through an IB program and succeed. Students take APs. They can succeed. A student up in the Upper Peninsula who has 20 students in the whole high school, well, slight exaggeration, but they, they can succeed. <laughs> yes, six. Um, you know, <laughs> so I think there, you know, it's more about the learner. Um, well, you know, how like, do you compare that really? Because I know men in public schools, both my daughters graduated from there, mm -hmm. and what level of education they received. Right. And I don't think it was really shown by their grade point. Do you weight the different schools in Michigan? We don't weight weigh them exactly, but what well, we, we do know the strength of the curriculum. So we, our admissions people who review applications know that Midland has, you know, an average ACT of 23.4. Um, and, and that, you know, X number of students go on to college and all of, all of those statistics that we look at at schools. So a student who 
has the advantages of coming to a school like that. We understand their preparedness for college. Uh, and we certainly weigh that into the decision. Uh, so we know a student coming from here may be better prepared than a student coming from and that Detroit Public School. School. Yeah. Great point. Yeah, right. Yeah. right. It's not just based on those numbers. All right. Well, thank you. Okay. You're welcome. Thank you. First, I want to take, say thank you to um, members of the audience that took the opportunity to come and share your insights and your input. I think that um, in the broad sense of, of thinking about the three questions that were posed and a lot of the inputs that were heard, one, I think that you've given um, great input to the district in terms of you know, their thinking. But I think even in the broader sense, we talked about paradigm. And having the community as well as having the schools think about what kind of paradigms exist in the um, district and in the, in the system and what in those paradigms needs to shift and change. So I have one final question for the panel as we wrap up. Lots of great input that we got from audience members participating. And after hearing the interchange this evening, if you would share with us final thoughts that you want to leave with the community tonight. And we'll start with Grace. Thank you. And, and I want to offer my thanks for coming and particularly the, the, the important questions we got from the audience. I want, to, I want to leave with the, the third leg of the stool that I talked about that completes the education and, that, and that's the, the, the leg that to me scares me the most about the future and that's the culture element. Um, and it's not an issue for just Midland Public Schools or any public schools and I'm going to speak in generalities here but we're getting students that are afraid to not work hard anymore and we're letting that happen. We've, we've developed in this country an entitlement culture and it's manifesting itself in the quality of people we're getting into organizations. And, we, and when we have people that come into organizations that have never failed, have never been challenged, have never had to work hard, we're going to work them hard, we're going to challenge them, and they're going to fail. And then they're not going to understand how they fail. People that, that come in, and we've, we've had to put in place training, um, uh, kind of a, it's not really weeding out, but we put training before people can come to work at Dow, be it, be it they come in as an engineer or, or as a process operator, we've raised that bar high because we could not afford to bring people in, invest the training, and find out that just coming to work at 7.30, that, that didn't, they didn't have to do that. And that, that, that is really sad. Um, and what's happened, I believe, is that we've, we've developed a society that likes to play not to lose. We need to become a society that plays to win. And there's a degree of difficulty, and there are risks, and, 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 and I'm glad you talked about that, because it's not just getting an A, it's how difficult it was to achieve that A. Um, and, and, and so, you know, as parents, I've heard, I've heard stories, you know, calling the teacher and finding out that their, their student didn't do as good, and trying to figure out what the teacher did wrong. Um, I, I, I saw, everybody has that with their kids. And I, I don't tolerate that with my kids. Every teacher I assume is high quality, and if they're not doing good, it's because my kids aren't doing good. And, and I, don't, I don't mean to get preachy, but we have to have people that accept accountability, accountability for results, have the courage to take risks and make things happen. And that's how we're going to get out of the, the problems that we've got in society today. And that's how we're going to get the kind of people that, that corporations like myself and the others up here need. And, and I just see things heading in the wrong direction there. And certainly you can start here in a place like Midland where we've got a good, hard, Midwestern work ethic, and that's why Dow Chemical has remained here for the 117 years that we've been in existence and will continue to remain here. We'll be the last to go, but my fear is we're being dragged down because of this culture of entitlement we have. Thanks. Yeah, I think uh, it's good to see so many people here that uh, you know, care about our educational system and want to have uh, providing input into it. I think there were some really good comments by the audience. Um, you know, I agree with Rich about, about the culture and the accountability, but also it's about the culture, about it's okay to fail. I mean, that is also a learning experience by itself, that you, know, you fail, you learn from it, and then you do better the next time. And I think we have, in our, our culture here, there's just 
that says that fear of failure. Um, you know, I, I, the, the comments, uh, um, I think, you know, what I came away with is that uh, not one size is going to fit all. We, we have to have different type of learning environments. We have children and students are going through the system that learn different ways. And, but, you know, in the end, they, they still need to learn those skills uh, that we were talking about um, earlier tonight. So, uh, you know, I, some thoughts for me, too, is, you know, I, it, you know, I, you know we, we, we talked about the, the uh, new tech and some other things, but there are still, you know, with the system we have, and there's still some accountability for the teachers, and they are measured uh, how the, their students perform on certain tests. And I think that is in uh, opposition to some of the things that we really need uh, to have for the, uh, what are the skills our students are going to need for the 21st century. Uh, the, it is very clear that, uh, you know, learning is not stopped in high school. That it needs to be a, it's a lifelong process that we need to uh, continue to learn, you know, it's an ever-changing environment, and it's being a, it's a very competitive environment, and our students and the people that are coming into our workforce need to be able to uh, adapt to that, and also work together so we can do great things. So, I think thank you, Kim, for moderating the, the panel. I think thanks for my fellow panelists also, and thank Carl and the board of directors for putting this on. Which is, uh, I wanted to talk briefly um, about the parallel things that are going on between, at least at the University of Michigan and here. So we are constantly doing curriculum development. We're constantly looking at our curricula to make sure that it's meeting the needs of the 21st century workforce. So it doesn't stop here. It, it continues. And I think a lot of the things that we've really introduced or emphasized recently are international experiences the entrepreneurial spirit, so some of the innovation, creativity that we're talking about tonight. Um, also, we're doing a lot of multidisciplinary experiences, so whether it's on a team or they are working with not just engineering disciplines, but other disciplines, so the arts, um, the psychology, <coughs> you name it, they're working in the natural resources areas, so our engineering students are working across boundaries, and I think that's really key. Um, the gentleman mentioned the integrated sciences aspect. I think that's kind of what we do in a way. We, we bring these things together. Um, and I actually studied an integrated humanities program as an undergrad, and I think the beauty of that is, is unbelievable. So good comment. Um, I think the passion, you know, to get students that, who are passionate. So if you can help them see it's, we've spoken about this, but if you can help them see that what they're learning and what it can accomplish and how you use it and how it's relevant in the world for them, I think that's key. Um, making a difference in the world, I don't know how many students tell me that. Why do you want to be an engineer? Because I want to change the world, because I think I can change the world, you know. Why do I want to be at the University of Michigan? Because I can do things that will make a difference. And I think if we can encourage students in elementary, middle school, and high school, that they can do that. I think that's what it's all about. That's what education is about. And you know, we talk a lot about um, mentoring and service and working with other students and trying to help. And I think our um, the emphasis on that and the emphasis on really trying to share your share your knowledge, share everything that you have, all those skills you have with other people around you is, is really key to success and whether it's in the classroom, in the workforce, or um, you know, throughout life. I think lifelong learning keeps being talked about, but there's no way you can stop learning in this society right now or you're really behind. Um, so I think that's key too. But I really I um, am really excited about this conversation tonight and being part of it. I think it's, it's opened my eyes to what's going on in this community, which I haven't really spent much time in, and I think we'll have to spend a lot more time in. So thank you so much. I'd like to start out just by thanking the teachers, Midland Public Schools. I want to see what the teachers we have. I try to make every parent-teacher uh, conference we can. They know my, my children. Uh, they know what they do well, what they do not so well. 
and uh, well, they, they coach us. I mean, it, it's awesome to have those, those kind of teachers in our school systems. And, uh, uh, you know, I, I could go on and on and, and name, uh, you know, teachers that are doing awesome things. There's a couple that say, uh, keep your eye out for uh, Chrissy Gayhart uh, is working right now in the healthcare area. Uh, find out uh, what, what that project team is doing. Uh, Randy Shavig uh, uh, is uh, uh, help facilitate the team. Penny Miller Nelson, you know, uh, just, just awesome people doing really pioneering work in education right now. So we really applaud those uh, individuals. You know, uh, and uh, I, I, I'll, I'll stop there. But uh, uh, Brian Smith is a common. Uh, uh, discussion around our dinner table, you know, German language stuff like that. But in uh, my uh, I could go on, but I won't. But uh, you know, um, you know, we learned this from Conway uh, in the 20th century, and uh, he, he said, you know, I hear and I forget. He said I see and I remember, and he said I do and I understand, and that's the essence of what we're talking about today. You know, I, I learned uh, the neutron flux equation from an MIT professor at Texas A&M. I could try that thing, you know, all day long. Uh, but it wasn't until I went to nuclear power school and spent a year uh, learning uh, how to operate a naval nuclear power plant that I really understood the neutron flux equation. Uh, but I really appreciated the neutron flux equation when I went out on the USS Guardfish out of San Diego and uh, we just come out dry dock, and we had to take it down to test depth. And I was going down and hearing the uh, pressure of the ocean uh, cause the uh, hole to groan. And uh, I realized that, uh, you know, here's 110 men with their lives at stake, depending on that neutron flux equation to work. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, you know, we talked about the square root of minus one and the big square root of one. Well, it's important to know whether you uh, inserted the control rods. In fact, uh, it got cooled the reactor down or it heated it up. So, uh, and, uh, you know, that was the only thing that kept us from going down to crush depth. So, uh, you know, there's, there's important reasons why our kids are learning these things. And that's what we want to do is we want to bring, you know, learning to life. And uh, that's the essence behind what we're talking about today. And, uh, you know, I mentioned earlier that we're 12 years into the 21st century. Get, get your mind around that. My 11th grader has known nothing about life uh, except for 911 and what, what, what life is like, you know, under that uh, influence. Uh, when I was with Dow, I had the privilege with, with the HH Dow Academy to go through India and China looking at, uh, you know, where we put our research centers. And uh, what impressed me most is as we went to the universities in China, you know, we went to universities around Shanghai, uh, uh, visited the uh, University of Wuhan, and up in Beijing. And uh, every single one of those universities we went to, they had one common theme. And we met with all the, the president on down uh, of the universities. That theme was in five years, we we're going to be the world leaders in it. And they were dead serious. They were focused on it. They believed it. And it, in it, the, 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 the whole education system was energized around that. And so, uh, you know, they're moving forward. It's, it's very good to see. I'm glad to see progress in the world. That's important to see. But whenever I uh, look at where we're at in the United States, we have tremendous opportunity in, ahead of us. First of all, we have a great basis to build on. And we have one of the best here in Midland Public Schools. But the question is, where do we go from here? It's not where we've been or where we are right now, but where do we go from here? Because the rest of the world is marching on. And so I think we got to be innovative, we got to be creative, uh, we got to take risk. And, uh, it, it, and, and what, what got us through, you know, I shared the analogy of the speed of light. That got us through the 20th century. And, you know, we, we've done great through the 20th century. But what are we going to do in the 21st century that's going to uh, advance society and, and benefit the younger children and future generations? So. Okay, well, I too feel enriched by the conversations this evening. I think we have lots of things that we can think about here at MPS, but in particular, uh, the remarks by the audience have uh, 
really given us some good things to talk about. I think we uh, have learned here tonight that we need to continue this quest for fostering lifelong learning, not only in schools, but in our community. But I think that would be enriched if we kind of get people excited about education. It's exciting to learn new things that you want to learn. We all do it. You see a class somewhere that you want to take, a Delta or at the Center for the Arts or somewhere, and you take it because you want to. And we have so many things that have pressed down upon the, at least the K-12 environment and the public in, in arena that have maybe caused us to lose a bit of that excitement for kids because although our teachers are very wonderful, and I too would like to say that all of the things we've been talking about wouldn't be possible without them and they work hard and they do excellent work as you talked about. But it's hard to continue to do that when you feel these outside pressures continuously telling you what you have to accomplish. So our goal becomes how can we accomplish what is necessary for us to accomplish to function and still maintain the excitement about learning. And if we can do that by adding to our toolbox things that are project based while still allowing us to meet what is required of us, which is really our biggest challenge, is to embrace these uh, legislative pieces that come, or and things that come even from each other that we think we should do, and still make learning fun, and still make learning excited, and make the students excited about learning, then we will foster learning, and we will continue to do that. And maybe the grit that Daniel Pink talks about in his book, this risk-taking, and creativity, and staying there, and not saying that if I'm not getting the grade I want, I should drop to a new level. I should work harder, if that's possible. And wherein can we do that? Well, if we're excited and passionate, maybe that's what carries us out, and that's a kernel that we should look at. We do have some new ideas that Kim and I have talked about and some others, about something in education that's called externships, where teachers actually go into business. And we've mentioned it a few times here, trying to look for some partnerships where a teacher might spend some time, we've talked to Glenn and Hospital and others, and spend maybe a week or a day or whatever we can work out. The teacher would just tag along, not students, we do that with students, but teachers could spend maybe up to a week, we don't even know what it could be, lead to, where they could be in the 21st century workplace and maybe see something outside of education. Many educators were students, they went to college, and now they teach. And they didn't spend a lot of time, or it was a little bit of time ago, and maybe being in those places would work. So externships is something that we also are looking to do. So I'm excited. We'll be looking through these um, tapes and uh, getting back to some folks maybe and um, thank all my participants in the panel and thank you Kim for being here tonight. Uh, one thirty second thing I'd like to add. Uh, next Saturday uh, across the street there's going to be a TEDx Midland event and these are exciting events. If you don't know about TED events, you have to get on the internet and find out about them. But actually, we're going to have three educational uh, speakers at these. Uh, they're, they're breakthrough thinkers. And actually, one of them is currently in the process of implementing the new tech high. So you might want to uh, come see that in uh, your opinion. Next Saturday? Next Saturday, 9 o'clock. Great. So we've heard much tonight. One of the quotes that I um, like to live by is having the understanding that the only constant really is change. And I wanted to first thank our panel for all their insights and <coughs> wisdom and knowledge that they shared with us this evening. Can we give them a hand? And I think that we all understand that we, we do have a task in front of us. As uh, Carl shared the statistics with us about Midland Public Schools, what we know, and what we know for sure is we're doing a lot better than other places in the world. But we also know that um, we can't rest on our laurels. We need to be hungry, and we need to work to do better. And some of the questions that were posed in these last and final thoughts from our panelists is how do we give students experiences to fail and learn? How do we build resourcefulness, tenacity, and resilience?
resilience, how do we become a district that produces students who play to win and not play to fail? And thank you. I also want to thank you to uh, all of the uh, folks that came up and were willing to share. And the district has put together even more opportunities to hear your voice and continue the dialogue. So I think each of you got a sheet tonight. Yours is probably longer than this. I just want to print it off and work. But at the bottom of the sheet, it gives you uh, a link to a Zoomerang survey link. So if you'd like to, uh, many of us are reflective thinkers. I know I am. And so there might be uh, thoughts that you have, and the district would love to hear those. Also, there's a tear-off portion at the bottom. So if you have comments, you can leave those uh, tonight. There'll be a taped version of uh, this uh, on the website uh, on uh, MPS TV also. And I think the, the Zoomerang survey, it says, will be available until February 19th. And I think that it says a lot when a school district and a community come together to have a dialogue about how do we get better? How do we continuously improve? And I do want to um, thank Carl for um, the invitation to come and be a part of this. And I'd ask that all of you take a moment to give yourself a hand for being here tonight. I think we wanted to have some final comments. Very briefly, how about a round of applause for Kim? She'll be the next one. We do not need a fifth or sixth person to summarize what happened this evening, so let me leave this parting thought with you. We made some people pretty nervous about putting on this panel discussion tonight. I've heard comments out in the community that, well, is this business trying to direct education on what we should do? What should our response as educators be to that? Shouldn't it be educators leading a discussion on preparing kids for the 21st century? And what I'd like to say to our community is, Let's relax about that. I've worked in three communities as an educator, had an opportunity to live in four in my adult life, and I've not seen one that has the merits and the characteristics of pulling together around numerous topics, much less one as important as the future of our children, your children, our students. This is not an end. This is just the beginning of the dialogue. So I hope our Board of Education hears from you on what you've heard tonight, and feel free to take advantage of giving us feedback. Thank you so much for being here.